thank you very much for that introduction. I'm always uh, a little hesitant when I hear the word expert being thrown around. Uh, my understanding from the practice of law that uh, dealing with expert witnesses is that the qualifications of being an expert was you had to be at least 50 miles from home and carry a briefcase. <laughs> um, I'm home. I'm not 50 miles from home. Uh, speaking with uh, Councilman Odom earlier, uh, we were both born at King Mountain Memorial Hospital, so I'm a son of Bristol, good or bad. Here I am. Uh, whether that qualifies as expert, I do not know. But uh, in any event, I'm pulling out my 1890s pocket watch so I can keep track here just a little bit, hopefully for your sake. I will tell you that uh, when my wife told my granddaughter that I was going to be talking tonight, she was going to bring her down here, uh, the first thing she said was, I'm bringing my headphones. So uh, <laughs> if at any point you need her to pass those headphones around, uh, just so indicate. I do plan to uh, talk about the history here. Uh, warts and all, uh, I'm here uh, more interested in uh, the historical uh, accuracy of, of the events that we're dealing with. So um, uh, forgive me uh, if I talk about some of the warts that were involved in this process as well. But 1890, what a year. Rose Kennedy was born that year. White David Eisenhower was born that year. The Daughters of the American Revolution was organized that year. And on February 12, 1890, the General Assembly of Virginia, as you have heard, uh, issued a charter to the citizens of the town of Goodson, changing its name to Bristol and creating it as an independent city. Now for a lot of people, the word independent city doesn't mean a lot. Well, let me tell you, it's a special designation. In the United States of America, the latest figures I heard or saw was that there were 41 independent cities in the United States. 38 of those cities can be found in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Commonwealth of Virginia has a long history of this as part of its uh, governmental process and uh, consistent with Virginia's approach to a lot of things, we have refused to change from that system. Uh, whereas the rest of the world uh, has taken a different approach. Virginia has held on to this concept of independent city. In case any of you ever end up on Jeopardy or in a trivia uh, game of some sort, I will tell you that the three independent cities outside the Commonwealth of Virginia are Baltimore, St. Louis, at Carson City, Nevada. Now, I can't explain why any of those are independent cities, uh, but those are the only independent cities outside of the Commonwealth. That does not include uh, consolidated city county governments or true independent cities. Well, uh, why would anyone want to be a, a, an independent city? Well, I'm not going to tell you that uh, right now. If I did, this would be the shortest lecture you've ever heard. <laughs> so to justify my existence, I'm going to plod over here uh, just a little bit. But I want to uh, try to set the scene for you to answer that question. Obviously, if we were not in the shoes of the participants there in 1890, um, we can't answer for each and every one of them. I think we can identify some of the circumstances that would make that move uh, appeal. Well, to get started on this, uh, this thought process of what I was going to say to you, I kind of conjured up a timeline in my mind uh, of we're 125 years out from the granting of the Charter, so I look back 125 years before the granting of the Charter, and uh, my finding uh, was, to me, just a little bit eerie. Uh, eerie because uh, that 250-year timeline uh, is almost precisely the time period of the involvement of English-speaking people in our immediate area. Uh, so this covers the whole uh, span of uh, English-speaking people uh, being involved in the activities of this area. 
and today and today only puts um, the granting of our charter smack dab in the middle of that timeline. I don't know why that's eerie, but it just struck me as a little eerie to uh, think of it in, in those terms. Now, I'm not going to take you through uh, that 250 years. Uh, time certainly would not permit that, but I want to highlight a few things that led up to the granting of the charter. And I am going to take you back uh, to a couple of events that kind of preceded that uh, 1765 starting point uh, that had an impact on, on directly. And the first one, 1738, the governor and council of Virginia uh, created two counties west of the Blue Ridge, Frederick and Augusta County. Augusta County uh, included virtually all of southwest Virginia, most, if not all, of what's now the state of Kentucky. It was a vast, vast territory. It took uh, Augusta County about seven years to get organized after uh, that designation. And in 1745, they had elected their first officials and were ready to start operating this wilderness. A man named James Patton was elected as the first sheriff of uh, Augusta County. Now, I assume, but I will tell you I do not know, I assume that part of the consideration for his willingness to serve as sheriff for this vast wilderness, which not only included southwest Virginia, Kentucky, a good chunk of Tennessee, which is still a sore subject <laughs> a little bit, but Augusta County, Virginia, was uh, thinking that uh, they were the, the, the a good portion of Tennessee was within its, what is now Tennessee, was within its boundaries. James Patton received a land grant of 120,000 acres of land. Uh, that's a good consideration, but then I'm not sure I'd want to be sheriff of a territory as, uh, as large as Augusta County was at that point. His 120,000 acres included us right here. He, uh, and along with his uh, son-in-law and others, uh, immediately uh, undertook to survey uh, his land grant and, and to see exactly what he had and to uh, lay out tracts, possibly for uh, financial uh, profit. And in about 1749, there were three specific tracts uh, laid out. Uh, one of them was uh, later referred to as the Sapling Grove Tract, 1,946 acres. It was done on behalf of James Taylor, who apparently had gotten an assignment from James Patton uh, for that purpose. 1749. Uh, then after that, nothing happened. We were wilderness. And insofar as I know, uh, there wasn't anything particularly uh, pertinent that took place in the wilderness that affects us here today until the 1760s. In the uh, 1760s, particularly the mid to late 1760s, English-speaking hunters, trappers, fur traders began making uh, uh, ventures into our areas, into our area, including uh, one with the name of Daniel Boone who came into this area. Uh, including uh, two uh, uh, close friends, originally from Maryland, but I recently read that maybe at this time uh, they were living in the Yadkin Valley area of North Carolina, which is also where Daniel Boone was from, uh, at that time anyway. Uh, Adam, Shelby, and Isaac Baker. Those are names familiar to you, uh, being residents of Bristol. Uh, Evan Shelby at uh, that time was known as a uh, hunter, Fur trader, trapper, uh, trader of uh, in other goods, and he and his friend Isaac Baker uh, came into the territory in the late 1760s, and they liked what they saw. Uh, they liked what they saw so much that they jointly arranged to purchase that sapling grove track that I told you about, and then they divided it equally uh, between themselves. Uh, Seven hundred. However many acres a piece uh, <coughs> to be. Uh, so uh, now we're, we're getting it down. Uh, the Sapling Grove track was identified on its uh, plant as Shallow Creek Waters of Indian River. And of course, today we know that Shallow Creek 
is called Beaver Creek. And Indian River is called Holston River. So to bring us up to date, we're talking about our territory at this point. Evan uh, Shelby uh, immediately uh, uh, proceeded with building a place to uh, live in the fort that ultimately uh, uh, grew up around him, uh, Fort Shelby, and you know where that was, over in the W. King House, over in Bristol, Tennessee. So, uh, all gone, he built in Bristol, Tennessee, his property that he got from a grant from Virginia. How did that work? That's another story. Uh, and uh, Isaac Baker uh, was living on Beaver Creek, uh, north of the community here at some point. I have not personally identified uh, where that spot is. We know that they were extremely close friends because each of them named a son after the other. Evan Shelby uh, named a son Isaac uh, after Isaac Baker. Isaac Shelby, of course, ultimately went to Kentucky, became the first governor of uh, Isaac Baker named his son Evan uh, after Evan Shelby. And uh, so far as I know, they remain friends. All I know is that I'm glad I was not a title attorney back in those days. <laughs> trying to certify a title to this property. Now, why do I say that? Because uh, from what I have read, and I hope I'm wrong, but from what I've read, uh, even though they made this purchase and immediately took possession and started uh, uh, using their properties apparently without resistance, my understanding is neither of these gentlemen ever saw a deed to their property. It was their executors or heirs that received the deeds to their property after their passing. And Evan Shelby uh, did not die until 1794. So, uh, uh, wow. I'm glad I was not their title attorney. <laughs> uh, in any event, uh, I'm not going to go through the history from there uh, in any detail because I know most people in this room are familiar with it. Uh, the uh, Baker property, 348 acres of it, was sold to John Goodson, father of Samuel Goodson, and uh, the King family uh, obtained the uh, Sackling Road portion of uh, Evan Shelby. Essentially, the Baker part was the northern part, and the Shelby part, uh, the more southern part. Well, uh, Goodson uh, acquired the property in 1799, and the Kings acquired the property in 1814. Uh, thereafter, there was a period of relative quiet, if you will, uh, as far as the use of that property. Reverend James King's uh, use of his property we're most familiar with was a large farm referred to as plantation uh, sometimes. Uh, and it uh, covered the area uh, where we are standing now, the city of Bristol. In, uh, to give you some little insight into how that, uh, that property was uh, in those days, come all the way up to 1847. And I've got a quote for you here. I had had some knowledge of the site of the town, referring to Bristol, for 20 and more years. It was known as Sackling Road Post Office, the home of Mr. James King, a Presbyterian minister. Here the lumbering old stagecoach stopped to deliver mail as I, a passenger, was on my way to college in 1847. Henry and Henry College, which was created in the 1830s. Well do I remember how the driver disturbed by nodding about daylight by a long, lonesome winding on his stage horn a half mile before we got to the house. The home of Mr. King was on the top of the hill northwest of the present railroad depot. And you know where that is. Where the main business part of the city now stands was Mr. King's Big Meadows. You may be sure that the town authorities have had no little labor and expense in getting a solid foundation for their streets along those Beaver Creek bottoms where Mr. King's shorthorns fattened in other days. I'll tell you who said that. <coughs> I have one more quote from it. So, we're uh, 1847 and things are hardly look like a town uh, around here. Uh, 1840s also began to uh, generate some 
talk about the railroad cutting. And believe me, if there's a sacred spot in Bristol, uh, in so far as the development of Bristol, you're on it <laughs> right now. Because the coming of the railroad uh, was the, uh, the crucial factor, uh, as it turns out, for the development of Bristol. Well, how did it come to be that, uh, that Bristol and the railroad ended up here? There was some allusion to that uh, by Mayor Brillhart. Let me quote from the same gentleman I was quoting uh, just a moment ago. The coming of the railroad had determined the location of the town. In those days, there were amusing reports as to how it happened that the road ever came there. It is said that the road for the shortest and best line ought to have been located to pass near Paperville, two or three miles east of Bristol. But the story runs that Mr. King had plenty of ham and eggs, and that Colonel Goodson, who owned the land on the Virginia side, had some fine brandy in his cellar, and that these gentlemen were very hospitable and free with their good things. And as Spurger said that the engineers who were located in the room had a tooth for said good things and often lodged where they were. Finally, someone drove a stake with some strange hieroglyphics upon it right at the state line where the road now crosses and the report got out that the Virginia engineers had done it. Now at the same time, there was a Corps of Engineers locating the Tennessee and Georgia Railroad going from Knoxville East. These were told that the Virginia Road would come to that stake, and so they headed for that point to meet the road. Thus, we are told, that mysterious stake settled the matter, and Bristol is there. There is no telling what ham and eggs and old rye may do in locating railroads in a town. Just how much truth there may be in the story, I don't know. But I do know that it would be ungenerous to insinuate that those gentlemen, Mr. King and Colonel Goodson, meant anything but old Virginia hospitality as they entertained their guests. Anyway, Bristol is there in a great city now where there was but a hamlet of scattered shacks 40 years ago, a city of 18 or 20,000 stirring progressive people today. Those uh, two quotes uh, come from uh, David Sullins, a Methodist minister who came to Bristol in 1868, uh, sent here by the Holston Conference of the Methodist Church to create a girls' school, later known as Sullins College. He also uh, uh, preached to a uh, early group of Methodists uh, who went on to become a group now known as State Street Methodist Church. Sullins is a, a, quite a character. This comes from the, the book that I was put on to by Jim Davis or his kin uh, there uh, called uh, Recollections of an Old Man, 70 Years in Dixie. And if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating. His stories of Civil War uh, life uh, during that period of time. There is a copy in the Bristol Library. Okay, well I don't promote that, and neither did say David Sullins promote that as the exact uh, explanation for how the railroad uh, got located to this particular point, but uh, it, uh, that's, that's the story that uh, went about, at least among some circles. Uh, whatever it was, uh, about 1852, uh, as we know, uh, James King's son-in-law, Joseph Anderson, gained about 100 acres and immediately planted out a planned city of Bristol that he called Bristol. And a planned community in the sense that there were lots of streets laid out on the plan. About the same time, Colonel Samuel Goodson did the same with his property. Uh, the uh, town of Goodsonville, he called it. Uh, generally, and I think the uh, proclamation may have uh, identified this, generally, uh, Joseph Anderson's property included what is now Bristol, Tennessee, was then Bristol, Tennessee, and the heart of downtown Bristol, Virginia, east and south of Beaver Creek. Uh, I don't know what changes in the course of Beaver Creek have been made over the, the last 125 years or so, or 150 years, but Beaver Creek, I believe, now intersects State Street down around Piedmont. Is that correct? Circles around. Uh, just above us uh, here. 
So the heart of, down of the business section of downtown Bristol uh, was from the Anderson plant, and the plant was named Bristol. Well, um, the idea caught on. Uh, lots were sold. People were getting enthusiastic. Uh, the railroad was coming, and it uh, looked like things were off to a very fine start. And then the Civil War. And the Civil War uh, caused lots of hopes and dreams to flicker uh, all over this country. Bristol didn't escape that. And uh, things uh, pretty much, uh, I suppose, were somewhat on hold uh, during that point as far as uh, substantial progress uh, was made. Uh, but progress was made in the number of people uh, coming into the area. Um, in 1856, as has been said, and as you already know, I'm sure, the state of Tennessee uh, incorporated uh, Bristol, Virginia. And the state of Virginia granted a uh, town charter for the town of Goodson. The town of Goodson was made up of the combination of Goodsonville and Joseph Anderson's portion of Bristol, Virginia, to form the town of Goodson. The charter for the town of Goodson, I have a copy of it with me. It takes up less than half a page. It is uh, five paragraphs. Two of those paragraphs have one sentence uh, in them. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot to it. There was an incorporation by reference of certain powers that could be found in the Code of Virginia, but less than half a page uh, constituted the charter for the town of Goodson. Um, near the end of the Civil War, we get one of our first visits from the uh, New York Times, or at least one of the first that I could find reported. And for whatever reason, uh, the New York Times has never been a big fan us down here in Southern Appalachia, and it started at an early time. And I want to share with you, uh, this was a reporter that apparently is following Civil War activities, particularly what was going on with the railroad from Knoxville and the Withhold area over in the Carolina. But when, they got, when he got to Bristol, here's what he reported. This is 1865, January. A straggling, half-finished village which has lately sprung up at the terminus of the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, lying partly in Virginia and partly in Tennessee. The locality was formerly called King's Meadows and was owned by General Evan Shelby, heroic hunting shirt soldier and statesman whose house and tomb are both to be seen at a short distance from the Magnolia Hotel. So much for the historic associations of Bristol. There is, however, nothing particularly romantic in its present condition. There are now to be seen straggling railway tracks, trains of empty and loaded cars, engines puffing and fuming, vast piles of wood, machine shops and taverns. There are warehouses full of wheat and corn, great herds of grunting, unambitious swine, about to travel in the cars for the first time in their lives. There are crowds of busy men, drinking, bold faced and chewing tobacco, spectators in land and pork, insolvent stage drivers, gaping country folks, babbling politicians. <laughs> and it gets worse. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> we were not a fan of that particular reporter uh, in these parts. But that's the description of uh, Bristol, at least in the eyes of an outsider. It completely misses you know, the visionaries that we had among us at the time uh, that were enthusiastic about the uh, potential for prosperity and growth and success of our community. Uh, they were completely missed in that process. But remember, that was still right at the very end of the Civil War. 1868 is when David Summons appeared here, and both Summons and uh, one other source uh, I saw uh, referred to uh, Bristol and Goodson having a population of maybe six to 800 people in this area. Well, that's not a lot of people, but it's a lot more than in 1652 when the plants were first laid down. Uh, we, had, we had people beginning to accumulate. It was taking shape as a town uh, without a doubt. Soon thereafter, soon after uh, uh, Summers uh, made that report, 
the train to ride. Actually, to ride before that, but uh, there was talk of more trains riding. Uh, the railroads uh, not only were here, but were coming. When I say railroads, I mean railroads. Uh, there were numerous railroad companies being formed, and you can find the names of prominent uh, uh, people of our community on the boards of directors and as investors in these railroads designed to bring coal from the coal fields from Big Stone Gap uh, into our area. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a booming time. The iron ore industry in our area uh, was still prominent at that time. Thanks a lot to uh, George Carter. Uh, coal is making itself known, timber. Uh, education uh, was uh, an appealing part of Bristol with Sullivan's College, King College, Emory and Henry College, and ultimately Virginia and Aramont College. Uh, so the Methodists with uh, Sullivan's, the Presbyterians with King, and the Baptists with Virginia and Aramont, they were all represented higher education uh, efforts uh, in, in our area. The enthusiasm was contagious uh, and it got uh, almost out of hand. It was uh, a mania almost. Uh, Sullins uh, talks about selling lots and expanding the uh, goods and family goods in the 1870s in which he became kind of the de facto uh, auctioneer. And he reported that uh, within a day and a half they sold about 140 lots. That's a lot of lots. <laughs> Not many real estate people around today that would uh, turn their back on an opportunity of, of that nature. So uh, the the uh, the dream had returned post Civil War. Uh, the visions of, of people for Bristol being a great commercial center uh, had returned post Civil War until 1887 January. 1887, we had another visit by the New York Times. And let me tell you what they thought in 1887. And uh, I told you, I'm going to tell you warts and all. Here is a town, referring to Bristol, <coughs> that for many a year, since somewhere about creation, has been dolefully and direfully sleepy. And except for the laying of eggs and the marketing of geese feathers and bullets, almost separated from the world so far as material interests go, content to leave work and care and all activity to the rest of mankind, even though the rest of mankind were thus also to reap all the cash profits of life. But change is epidemic below Mason and Dixon's line just now. And even here, that spirit is pervading. Consider this. Twelve months ago, real estate in Bristol dragged in the market. The native who made a sale or tried to make a sale was looked upon by brother and uh, by brother natives with about equal feelings of distrust and astonishment. In 90 days has come a revolution. The drowsiest and the laziest mortals in all the country round are now deep in a speculating fever. Suddenly, Bristol has loomed up with a prospective future. When men get the speculative mania, they don't mind work, for they don't notice it, don't feel it. Bristol is become veritably a little hurly-burly, and land that could not be sold at any price last October has now doubled and quadrupled in value. So, our friends at the New York Times, they, uh, they recognize that things are happening here in Bristol. They recognize that things are, are taking uh, uh, hold uh, in the commercial end of things, but they can't pass up the opportunity to uh, comment and help establish the stereotype of our area. So uh, give that what weight you will. That, uh, that concept uh, or idea of what Bristol was about certainly was not shared by the business leaders of the community and the people that had vision for Bristol, for they were hard at work. Land development companies were springing up uh, everywhere. Outside investors were coming in uh, for coal, for railroads, for the iron ore, uh, and things, in fact, were truly bubbling. That leads us up to December 16, 1889. There's a called meeting of the town council 
or the town of Goodson. The call meeting, a couple of people were not present. And at that meeting, town council uh, appointed two persons to go out and make a census of the community just as quickly as they could. And this is going to be worse than all too eventually. Uh, so they appointed the mayor of the town of Goodson, and they appointed an, an attorney who was prominent uh, in the community to go out and uh, take that census. This is a meeting on the 9th of December 16th. They finished their work on January 4 and made their report to council on January 7 and happily reported that there were 5,382 residents of the town of Goodson. People were delighted. Why were they delighted? Because the law of Virginia at that time provided that if you wanted to be a, an independent city in Virginia, you had to have a population of 5,000 people. Well, the mayor and the attorney reported that 5,382 people resided in the town of Goodson. And uh, William Francis Ray, who had, uh, was a, had been in the state senate of Virginia, uh, now serving as a private uh, attorney and was town attorney for the town of Goodson, was instructed to get the works underway for the General Assembly about to convene uh, in Richmond. And that he did. He went to Richmond, he provided the local uh, state senator and the delegate with the information that was needed. And February 12, uh, 1890, just a little bit later, uh, the General Assembly acted favorably in granting this city charter. So all was well, everybody's excited, uh, things are moving ahead. Oops, it's 1890. What's that mean? It means it's federal census time. The federal census number comes in in June of 1890. The federal census report for the town of Goodson, 2,929. Oops, what do we got here? Well, we've got a chart for an independent city, or city of uh, Bristol, Virginia. The federal census uh, had no meaning to uh, whether or not the General Assembly of Virginia was going to grant a charter or not. Uh, the General Assembly of Virginia relied upon the census that uh, was taken by the mayor and the attorney uh, in Bristol. There were certain allegations made, in fact, certain litigation that got started uh, up in Washington County uh, uh, that tangentially uh, uh, brought up these issues. But it was 18 years later that it all got flushed out. Everything put on the table. Uh, it, it was all before the world to see as to what went on. Uh, when the charter was granted, that Bristol is an independent city, one of the things that meant was that Bristol got its own court of record. If you're a town, like Goodson was, you still shared and participated in the court of record for the county that you were in. Uh, so in our case, in Abbey. Uh, but once we have an independent city, we have our own court of record. Well, almost simultaneously with the General Assembly uh, uh, granting the charter for an independent city, uh, the General Assembly named William Francis Ray as the first judge of the Corporation Court in the city of Bristol. Well, let me tell you, Judge Ray, uh, his portrait is in the courtroom uh, in our courthouse, and uh, uh, to quote uh, George Warren one time when he was looking at that portrait, he said, he looks like he can overrule an objection. <laughs> he, was, he was one tough old bird, I'm telling you. And he was not intimidated by allegations uh, fraud or anything else and had to endure them a, a number of times. He became the focal point for allegations that he orchestrated a fraudulent census count so he could get a job as a corporation court judge, which he denied and in fact uh, uh, was supported in the idea that he didn't want the job and told him he didn't want the job. But members of the bar and others came to him and urged him to take it and he did so. He also got caught up. Uh, he had, after he served as 
judge. He uh, served two terms in Congress. Uh, ran for Congress three times, was defeated the last time, uh, but each of those races involved allegations of fraud uh, in the election. Of course, that went both ways down here back then, so I don't know if that's anything unusual. It led to a shootout in the Bristol, Virginia courthouse, which is for another day, another story. But Judge Ray was tough and not intimidated by this. And 1908, 18 years later, Edward Swanson of Virginia uh, appointed him to the State Corporation Court, uh, the State Corporation Commission of Virginia. That was the opportunity that Judge Ray's political opponents uh, took to really thrash it out with him. And they dragged out everything for multi-day hearings and multi-night hearings before the Senate of Virginia, Senate Committee of Virginia, uh, considering uh, his uh, appointment to the State Corporation Commission. Many, many witnesses uh, came uh, to testify for and against him, including the sitting governor of Virginia who testified for him. In the end, uh, he was vindicated uh, that he had no part in that. And there was no ultimate resolution for who was right or wrong in the census taking back in 1890. You have the two men, the mayor of the town and attorney, saying it was over 5,000 count. You have a single federal census taker saying it was 2,900. That single uh, federal census taker was a federal employee who worked as a whiskey gauger. I don't know what a whiskey gauger is. But he was a whisker, whiskey gauger employed by apparently the uh, federal government for his regular job. And of course the allegations were all over the, uh, the board. He testified before the Virginia Senate that he was told by Judge Gray he should go out and take the census the way the mayor and the attorney did. And he said, how's that? And he said, well, go down to the Opry House and count people as they come and go. Others suggested that they just count people on the street. I'm not suggesting that they were not right. I don't know if the federal census taker simply didn't do his job or was under time constraints to turn in the number that he had. I don't know. It, yeah, that has not been resolved. But what has been resolved is we, we got our chart. Now, why did we want a chart? Good thing I looked at my why would you want to be an independent city? I'm going to let you uh, answer that a little bit, but I'm going to give you some hints. <laughs> Different people are, are approached to this. Yeah. If you're an independent city, Washington County is not going to help you out of your financial woes. Well, that's not anything different today, is it? <laughs> uh, you're on your own. You stand on your feet. But what that tells you is you have more control over what's happening in your concentrated community. There are other reasons for that that have been problems. Uh, city status uh, can enable you to involve in certain financial transactions that perhaps uh, towns cannot. For example, the original charter for the city of Bristol authorized them to invest, I believe it's up to 25% in the capital stock of a company performing work for the city up to a maximum of $50,000. Well, there's another interesting uh, little story that's hinted at. Uh, you know, one of the signs of, of uh, the excitement that was going on in our economy was the Fairmount Hotel over on the Tennessee side. 25% uh, owner of the Fairmount Hotel was a uh, gentleman named General Thomas Ewing. Uh, General Thomas Ewing also happened to be the president of the Danville East Tennessee Railroad. And he's trying to get funding to get, you know, that railroad going uh, down to here. And he's a primary shareholder in the Fairmount Hotel, uh, which would have been a big resort-type hotel here in our community. Uh, so he has an interest in this working. Only if Bristol was an independent city could Bristol participate in, uh, in getting funding to assist a project of that nature. Uh, in the original charter, they were authorized to uh, invest up to 
$50,000 and 25% of the stock. Uh, probably a month later, that charter, that charter was amended to allow a $75,000 uh, investment uh, in some way uh, that could be used for that, those purposes. An additional factor that was at play out there is more psychological than anything else. But the town of Goodson never got the respect that it desired and perhaps deserved. That was one of my public factors. Well, if you board the train in Lynchburg, come to here, you bought a ticket to Bristol. You didn't buy a ticket to Goodson. Well, where's our train station? It's in Goodson. You couldn't buy a ticket to Goodson. You bought a ticket to Bristol. To the outside world, this was Bristol. This was Bristol. It needed to be a common name. Uh, Joseph Anderson's plant called the downtown portion Bristol. It only went to Goodson in that 1856, and some people never got away from that. The charter itself, uh, the original charter, is of uh, uh, some interest. Uh, Provided for a principal officer, the mayor, who was not voted unless there was time, uh, nine councilmen, three wards, uh, various other officers, uh, authorized the uh, city to uh, deal with uh, vagrants, speeding horses, and uh, uh, installation of sidewalks, and taxing adjoining landowners. Uh, it contains about 18 pages of the Acts of Assembly. I told you the uh, Town of Goodson Charter was less than half a page. The charter for the uh, City of Bristol was 18 pages. Uh, Town of Goodson had five paragraphs in this charter. This one's got, I think it's 68 or 69 uh, numbered paragraphs in this charter with very specific provisions. I have a difference because in Virginia and many other states, municipalities are bound by what they call the Dillon Rule. And while it is home rule here in Independent City, you can only do what the state has authorized you to do. Uh, and so, they had to be very specific. And because of that, amendments to the charter uh, were numerous and frequent. One of the first uh, amendments also to the original city charter uh, was to authorize an increase in pay to the Corporation Court Judge. Uh, you don't get too excited with the uh, original uh, pay that was authorized was $750 to $1,000 a year at the uh, at city council's uh, discretion, and it was raised from that to $1,000 to $1,250. Out of curiosity, I went through one of those uh, uh, programs to see what it was in today's dollars, $26,000, $27,000. So uh, not particularly uh, well paid. I don't know what all the circumstances were. I gather it wasn't completely a full-time job because William Francis Ray appeared uh, as counsel of record during the time he was judge in the United States Supreme Court as one of the counsel of record for the Commonwealth of Virginia in the state by dispute. So uh, we got our charter. Uh, things were underway. Amendments were coming uh, right and left. Uh, the charter, uh, as I say, uh, was very, very fact specific on its authorization. One of the early amendments to the charter as well, uh, within two years, was to specify specifically the kind of sidewalk that could be installed. Apparently, language in the first charter for installation of sidewalks uh, wasn't specific enough under this idea that you only had the authority that the state said it that you had. Well, let me quote once again uh, David Sullins, and, and I will uh, sit down here. Uh, as he left the city of Bristol in 1880, he left to become president of Emory and Henry College. And his thought at that time was as follows. We must get ready to say goodbye to the vigorous young city, which like a strong athlete was training for the final grapple with conditions which would place it among the great commercial cities of the land. And those Preston Summers uh, from Abington. There has been something about the location of Bristol that attracted the attention of the early explorers of our country and afterwards many of our best and noble citizens. Before I make the final comment, uh, it's just sprung to mind. Uh,
Sullivan was uh, suggesting at one point, there was a little bit of tension between uh, leaders in Abingdon and the community in Bristol when they were trying to uh, get all of this going. That tension came about because that uh, many of the uh, primary landowners in Abingdon that controlled the things that were going on in Abingdon didn't want all of this activity coming into this area. They liked life as it was. And uh, I got the impression, these aren't Sullivan's words, but I got the impression that perhaps it's okay to them to see us go <laughs> to an independent state uh, status. Uh, I, I don't know. But there was, there was a different mentality, apparently. Uh, people in, Vic, in, in Bristol here were working hard to bring people in uh, as well as commerce. And the general statement from Sullivan's is folks in Abingdon were more content with their status. Well, that has brought uh, politicians uh, uh, down uh, before when one would advocate a consolidation or so forth when there are differing uh, uh, philosophies about uh, how government should operate. In any event, I conclude by saying that uh, may the early mystique that was Bristol's in its formative years be renewed and fill us, the citizens of Bristol, with an optimism that will not be suppressed May our leaders, both in government and in business, propel us to greater heights in the future. Happy 125th Bristol.
and it was not changed until Bristol, Virginia drew up a new town uh, in 1890s, a new charter, and it, until it became a partner with the city of Bristol, Tennessee. The crisis was over in terms of the city identity, but uh, there were many more challenges because it became an independent city, which Judge Fanning of eloquently spoke of uh, what the independent city is. So the independent city and the Twin Cities took on a new meaning as evidenced by the historic sign, which was the on State Street. I want to invite you all to the birthplace of country music uh, to see the exhibit, uh, significant elements of Bristol, Virginia, from Sapling Grove to Independence City. This historical exhibit will show through original documents and memorabilia the transition from the two private estates, the King and the Goodson Estates, here at Sapling Grove through the development of the townships and then to Bristol, Virginia, becoming an independent city in 1890. The exhibit will extend from uh, Tuesday, February 17th to March 7th, and it's free to the public. You'll, you can go there during the opening hours. <coughs> the Significant Elements exhibit is free, and it's located in the Blue Stocking Club Learning Center. Uh, the museum admission still applies if you want to go to the uh, BCC uh, exhibits, but in which I encourage you to do that. Uh, among the things in the exhibits, and I think you might want to see, uh, the original documents found in the Sapling Grove Post Office. Uh, there are uh, the, the, the original postal line for the town of Bristol Goodson in 1853 to 1856. Uh, original uh, wares from Isaac Baker, which are the property of the north side of the line. And the original maps showing the plats of Bristol and the plats for good so the original and you'll see all the original things that exhibit so I look forward to seeing you there uh, during those three weeks thank you Robert. thank you